Hey guys, uh, welcome to the channel. We're shooting from the Fortified Castle here today. And um, this is uh, the fifth part of how to date knives. And today we're going to be looking how, at how construction can help you to um, date a knife. And um, if you'll uh, remember, I, I uh, told you that I would bring this uh, all together for you. In the last video, I gave a short clip of how to, um, um, that process you go through for Dayton knives. And before we get into construction, I'm going to uh, show you today on uh, a little, little more detail on how you, the process goes for dating those knives. And um, if you look at this knife right here, it is a single, uh, uh, a swell center bare head uh, pen knife and uh, remember uh, we talked when we were talking about patterns I said if it's unusual that usually indicates an earlier date and um, this is kind of unusual uh, I researched this and uh, I found a um, case made a bare head um, uh, swell center bare head <clears throat> but that was a jackknife and uh, Walden made a uh, bare head uh, swell center pen knife for uh, EC Simmons. So this is uh, definitely unusual and would indicate uh, 18th century origin. And so um, when we open it up, uh, we can see there the tank stamp, H and S. And if you notice the font on that, it's a serif font, that kind of old looking kind of font. And um, we uh, talked about in markings that, that that's an indicator of 1800s. So you'll see that probably all the way up to 1920, but it's a really good indicator of a knife from the 18th century. So we already have two indications that this knife is from the 1800s. Um, when I looked this up, there's no listing and goings for it. I looked in other, other references. I couldn't find it. And so, um, um, that brings us back to square one, and we're going to have to look uh, further to try to figure out the story on this knife. And um, so the best way to do that, we talked about in patterns, is that a uh, pattern oftentimes can give you a good indication on uh, the age of a knife. So if we open this up and look at the pattern on this knife, what stands out is that both these blades are equal. And so if you run a straight edge across there, they're pretty equal. And um, what this knife is, is a uh, quill knife. And so um, quill knives are pen knives that have equal blades. Usually they're a coping blade or maybe a, a sheep's foot. Um, in this case, they're spear point um, blades. Kind of unusual, but uh, it's still a, a, a quill knife. And that's lucky for us because uh, it allows us to really uh, hone in and date this knife uh, without the tang stamp. And so um, uh, quill knives first started out as uh, fixed blades. And then um, in the 1700s, they turned into uh, folding blades, single blade folding knife. And then after that, in the late 1700s, they went to uh, two blades. And um, these were the first multi-blade knives right here. And um, all multi-blades came off of this uh, quill type design here. Um, so these were uh, popular up until uh, 1830. That was kind of the zenith of quill knives. And in um, in uh, 1790, um, they invented the uh, steel quill or pen. This is a pen. And in 1828, they were uh, starting to be mass produced in England, steel tipped uh, quills. And so uh, <clears throat> obviously you don't need a uh, something to sharpen them if you have steel tips. So uh, by 1850, this knife was... Uh, being less and less produced. 
And uh, Levin says that by uh, the late 1800s, they were virtually non-existent. Every now and then somebody would make them, but uh, they had uh, way past their day. And so that gives us a good date for this knife of 1850 to 1800, I would say. And um, if you look at this, um, it's a natural bone. And so um, they really didn't start dyeing bone until the uh, 1850s when it became economical to do so. And so um, this also confirms an early date for this knife. Um, you certainly can find natural bone today, but um, they hadn't even uh, mass-produced uh, dyed bone yet by the 1850s. So um, it all confirms the date on this knife. So um, right now what I want to do is uh, look at this area right here. So see how that comes up very square and then you have a square kick on this uh, knife. You can see it better over here. It's really square on this side right there. And um, those square kicks went out of fashion in 1850. So they used to uh, assist in in uh, pinning the blade, but after 1850, they came up with other methods, <clears throat> and the kicks start turning into that what we're used to today, which is kind of a curve, and it comes to a point. And um, so again, the the construction of the blade confirms that it's an early 1800 knife, and um, that's about all we could do on this knife without any other information. But if you look at the other side of the blade here. Let me get that, that back. If you look at the other side of the blade here, there's a nine on there. So um, the English were real big on putting numbers on their knives. Um, they signified the street address to which uh, they were from, like nine Piccadilly uh, Square. And um, you couldn't put Piccadilly on here, so you just put a nine. And um, so that uh, the Germans did that too. Um, but not as much as the British, so I would suspect that this is an English knife. The other thing is, if you look at this knife close, it's really well made. See that? Um, you notice that the pens are not um, very well formed, um, but they're, they're, they're done okay, and they're all smooth like they should be across the surface. And uh, this is an, another indication that the knife is from the 1800s when the um, pens aren't formed very well. Some of them uh, early in the 1800s were actually rectangles, uh, like roofing knives. And so that's just another indication that this is an early knife. Um, so I would conclude uh, with 70% confidence that this was an English knife produced in the 1850s or a little earlier and um, it there's probably about a 30 percent chance it could be German at this point so um, I went about a year and a half uh, having this knife I never leave something I'm always looking for better ways uh, doing research on better ways to identify knives makers and country of origin and so I came across a research paper uh, called um, base, base Metal Tableware Marks. And uh, what that basically was is a listing of um, silversmiths and goldsmiths and electroplaters in England. But it also had other manufacturers uh, listed in it as well. And um, I still couldn't cross this mark. But at the end of the paper, it had uh, a listing of numbers. Remember that nine? And so um, uh, there were about six to eight manufacturers that used nine on their knives. And so I went through each one. And only one used the uh, uh, had an H or an S in their name. And that was Hancock and Sons. And so um, knowing that, I researched Hancock and Sons. Um, and um, they produce pen knives and farrier knives. And this knife was uh, produced between 1840 and 1860. And that's how you use that logical thought process and all these indicators to work through 
um, and identify a knife. And the other lesson here is don't give up, right? So I never give up on a knife. I'm always looking for ways and research that might help me identify the knife. And a year and a half later, I found it. And so um, now we'll look at um, how construction can help you uh, uh, date a knife. And so the first thing I want to look at is uh, blades. So when you look at this blade, um, the first thing I want you to notice is how high this blade is in relation to the bolster. So if you take a straight edge and you go over there, you see that gap in the bolster there? See it? And so it's quite a bit higher than the bolster. And you probably never notice that, but you won't see that on uh, modern knives. And you won't see it on knives in the uh, early 20th century either. And so um, let me show, just show you another example. Here's another example, and it's even higher than the last one. This is a Wade uh, Wingfield and Robotham knife, and it dates to the 1860s also. And... Um, so this is a really good indicator of a knife that's pretty old, okay? Um, they started moving these blades down so that the top of the blade would be closer to the bolster in the late um, 1800s. And let me see if I got one. So if we look at this knife, this uh, produced between 1890 and 1920, and you can see how much closer... Um, that blade is to the top of there. But um, there's another thing I want you to notice about this. When you look at this knife, see this uh, gap right here? And then right here over in this area, there's a gap. And so the Bokaso, the tang is extended. It's longer than it needs to be. And this is characteristic of knives that are produced uh, in the mid to early 1800s. And as time goes on, this, this gap is going to close. You can see on this knife, it's not as bad, but they roughly date to the same period of time. And that's what I'm talking about. That gap kind of go, goes away. Um, another example, you can see it more clearly on a small knife. Look how long that Ricasso is. On the knife that's that portion of the blade underneath uh, underneath the uh, cutting edge um, this is a Ricasso and see how long that is and that is a uh, indicator of an early knife and um, these got smaller as time went on and um, let's see if I get you another example here so this is a knife produced uh, in the early 20th century, and you can see that there's hardly any gap here, and it's actually um, below, slightly below the, the end of the uh, bolster. Knives continue to drop to about this area right here, uh, is what uh, normally you see now in, to, in knives today. Um, and... Um, Okay, sorry, I had a call there, so the uh, recording stopped. All right, guys, sorry about that. I had to answer a call from my uh, daughter. Anyhow, we were talking about the Ricasso's and how they uh, get smaller and smaller here and tuck in behind these uh, bolsters. So another uh, indicator on these knives, we've talked about this in the past, is these stampings. And so uh, this is prevalent from the 1600s all the way up to the, the 1900s. And, um, you know, it pretty much goes away. You can still find some knives that are stamped in the early 20th century. But um, mostly, uh, most manufacturers quit doing that. And that's a good indicator of an of a early knife. And as a matter of fact, if we look at this knife here, it's a Wade, Wingfield, and Robotham, and uh, it's stamped also. And so uh, that's pretty pretty common for those kinds of uh, knives. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is the thickness of the steel. If you look at this knife, 
it's pretty, pretty thick steel. You see that? And if you look at this one, it's the same way. It's pretty, pretty thick steel. And um, if you take this knife, uh, which is about the same size, this knife is from uh, uh, 1944. And if you put it up against the other one, you can see how much larger this this uh, back spring is in comparison to this back spring. And if you flip them over, it's the same with the blade steel. So it's very thin and pretty big. So this this is a thickness that you would find on uh, some uh, smaller uh, four to six inch fixed blades now. And the reason for that is the steel. So um, this is... Um, the, the old steel is uh, cast steel, and this steel is made through the uh, Bessemer process, um, and so it's bigger. And um, starting in the uh, 20th century, you have uh, electric arc uh, steel, and so the higher temperatures allow uh, um, you to produce a steel that's more pure, and that equals strength. And so these steels, even though cast steel was stronger than shear steel, it's still not as strong as modern day steels and they had to be thicker. So that's a, a really good indicator um, of, um, of uh, knives. And so from there, we're gonna go to uh, bolsters. And uh, let me find my examples here. So uh, this knife is produced between 1960 and 1970. This one is produced uh, between 1900 and uh, ni actually 1910 and 1940. So you have a very nicely formed round bolster here. And you have a very nicely formed square bolster here. And these are the main two types of bolsters that you see today and that you saw at the turn of the uh, 20th century. Um, there are some exceptions to that. So uh, this bolster here is uh, between uh, 1922 and 1940. And you see this cut through there and that's called a thread. And so uh, sometimes this is like two or three times as wide and we call that a rat tail thread. And um, they're just a little bit bigger. And um, that is kind of a fancy bolster. So... Uh, let me find an example of it. So, um, you can find in the early 20th century um, uh, crimped bolsters that are crimped on the end like this. You can find them with these crimps here. And you can also find uh, examples of fluted bolsters. And so these grooves up there here are called flutes. And that's a fluted bolster. And uh, not so large as this, but um, there are examples of fluted and crowned bolsters in the early 20th century. But those are, aren't really common. And um, this is mainly what you're going to find when you're collecting knives from the uh, early 20th century. So when you go back in time, uh, you start seeing knives like this. Um, so this crimp bolster is fairly common. Uh, mostly uh, you're going to see just regular round bolsters, but the fancy bolsters were uh, crimped. And uh, really fancy bolsters would be triple crimped. So this knife is from the 1830s and it has three crimps. By the late 1800s, a fancy one might have two crimps or just one. And that's kind of the way it went. And um, I have seen uh, a triple crimp bolster from the late uh, 1800s, 1895 to 1910 um, probably. But um, for the most part, this is, this is a pretty early thing here. And they went to this. And so you see these crimp bolsters up until 1910 um, probably. Uh, after 1920, you're not seeing any at all, and they just kind of go away. As we go back in time, um, I'll show you this again. You've seen it before. It's an example of a dirk. Um, 
these things uh, uh, made between 19 or 1840 and 1870 were really fancy. But the deal about these dirks is they were very high-end uh, knives. This is not common to that era. It's common for dirks and bowie knives. High-end knives, often coated with silver or gold, inlaid uh, with mother of pearl or even gems sometimes, and uh, very premium uh, scales or cover materials. This is horn here, and this is a reproduction, but it's very close to what um, uh, they produce in that time period. Um, as far as uh, reg regular um, knives go, this is a knife produced between uh, 1850 and 1890, and they mostly had, uh, you know, regular bolsters on them or bare heads, and um, that's because uh, they cost way less, and people didn't have a lot of money then to spend on fancy bolsters and adornments and silver and gold on our knife. So they were pretty simple knives. So um, um, that's how uh, bolsters can be an indicator to you. Um, you know, uh, fancy were these multiple thread knives, a little less expensive than the uh, carved bolsters I just showed you. And um, you see them on this knife here. This knife dates to 1850. And it has threads, multiple threads, and a crimp. And the uh, back is uh, worked. Really, really fancy knife and expensive knife. And um, that's uncommon, though. So um, from the bolsters, we're going to go to um, pens, I think, right now. It's a good time to do that. So if you look at uh, pens, you, you notice the cover pens on this knife are very, very small. This is a four inch knife and it's a jumbo knife. It's a really big knife. I don't know what that is on my knife. Um, but little tiny pens. You notice that the um, backspring uh, pen in the head pen is uh, bigger, a lot bigger then these uh, look at them in relationship to to each other quite a bit larger um, here's another one same thing you have smaller pens and then the uh, head pen and the uh, back spring pen is really large on there so that's that's an indicator for us these these small pens on knives when you see them equal size like these are it's because there's no bolster here so this pen has to be big because it's a pivot pen and so it's as big as the uh, backspring pen on this knife but um, when there's bolsters on the knife they're going to be a lot a lot smaller than the other pens this is a Utica serpentine knife here um, early one you know around 19 uh, 20 or so and little tiny pens in comparison to the the one here and uh, what they evolved to is if you look at this knife um, the cover pens are now look at the two difference between the two the cover pens about uh, uh, two-thirds the size of the uh, back spring pen they're getting bigger and um, you see that on this knife too. This is, oh, I think this is a Utica too. Um, but you can tell that they're about um, two thirds the size of this pen right here. They're not little tiny pens anymore. And eventually, when they get to the uh, 60s and 70s, they're almost equal size. And in a lot of cases, they are exactly equal, uh, the pens. They just get bigger and bigger. And, um, to be the same size as the back spring pen. So um, pens are a good indicator um, of an early knife. Uh, another thing about pens, let me find a good example for you here. If you look at these pens, they're really well formed. 
see that almost completely circular and um, I'll show you this see how perfect those pens are in the early 20th century so uh, when you go back in time um, what you see is this is this is one of the reasons I think this knife, it could date to 1920, but I think it's more like 1890, 95. Look how irregular those pins are. And this is a Wolstinghome. A very fine knife manufacturer. And so, you see those pins. They're not as regular as the uh, 20th century pins. Um, this is a knife that dates to 18... Um, 30 and it's almost this pen is almost a, a uh, rectangle that one's pretty good and this one's not bad but they're irregular they're not completely round this one's not too good you can see that one is kind of round and kind of chopped up this one's oblong and so um you know this is 1830 1890 a little better and then 20th century better yet and then as you go forward they're almost perfect nowadays the pens that they put in the uh, knives so pens are really good indicators of, of uh, age on a knife um where are we going to go now so let's look at scales now um this is a modern buck knife and um I'm going to open it up and um, if you look at the scales there's no pins on the scale but if you look inside you see the black is a uh, nub that's on the scale that's pressed into it and then the silver uh, indentations are where the liner is pressed up into the uh, into the scale so basically these are the liner and the scales pressed together and I don't know whether they use glue on this honestly or not but um, you know that's a new technology and you won't see that on older knives um, in the in the 80s and 90s um, a lot of manufacturers were just gluing these on and that's not very good right so that's that's your postmodern uh, um, construction. This knife produced between 1960 and 1970 is penned as it should be. And, uh, but it's, uh, you know, the scales are plastic on this knife. You go back in time and, um, you know, that they're just penned right. The next thing you look at, um, is, um, Let's look at let's look at uh, shields so this shield here is glued in and if you open this knife up and you look on the inside like we can see the pins for this you don't see any pin for that and that's how you know that it's glued this starts cropping up in the 70s so from uh, in 1980 it's like full-blown they're just gluing all of these things in and saving man hours and time and material on penning them but traditionally they were penned and that's what you see as you go back in time another thing about um, um, scales or shields is in the turn of the uh, 20th century uh, say from 1900 up to 1940 there's a proliferation of different um, shields. Um, this is a GIMP shield. You have your standard uh, um, bar shield. There were polygonal shields. Um, this one is a uh, propeller shield. So it's kind of round in the middle and looks like a propeller. And um, just all kinds of different shields. Um, bomb shield. But when you get back into the 1880s, uh, before like uh, 1890, it, it's a lot simpler. And um, this knife, which dates to the 1860s, has no shield at all. This knife, which we just dated, 
has no shield at all. This knife, which actually I think is earlier than the middle of the 1800s, has no shield at all. And so when they did have shields, they were a lot simpler in the 1800s. So a simple bar shield like this, a simple shield like that, that's really a shield. And let me see if I can find one. Wow, I don't even think I have an example of one. Here's one. So that's a shield, and this is a federal shield. What they look like. The federal shields had these little things on top. Um, but they're just simple shields. And um, this dates to the 1890s, and it's got an oval on it. And so the shields, if they had them on there, were much simpler in the 1800s. And uh, towards the end, you start seeing the big elaborate shields after 1890. Um, sometimes you see them like this big on a knife. That's really like 1890 to 1910 when they were doing that extravagant shield, really big shields on uh, knives. Uh, what else do we have to cover here? All right, I think that's about it. Um, the takeaway from this is very early knives uh, like this, dating to the first part of the 1800s, are very basic. It's basically a slip joint peasant knife. You can see that the construction on this knife is not really good at all. And this is an English knife. And um, just very basic, no shield, uh, wood scales. And even though they were producing knives like this, these are going to guys who are very affluent, which are very few, okay? Very few of these type knives are actually being made. And most of the knives are like this. As you get on into the middle of the 1800s, you know, they have nice bolsters, but they're still just wood. And even the upper scale ones are wood with ebony. And, um, you know, they're still just very simple uh, knives. Uh, they're not uh, very complicated at all. The, the upper end ones can have uh, tremendous craft, craftsmanship on them. But uh, overall, you know, the knives are very simple. And where they really start to get crazy with... Um, all kinds of different designs is uh, once you move into the um, 20th century, they start changing from this to this to crazy colors like this. And then all kinds of different patterns and designs that just um, proliferate. So um, I hope that really helps you out and you found it um, informative and um, I know it was a long video, but again, it's a lot of stuff, a lot of ground to try to cover um, and put in a little short space. So um, if you'd like to see more content like this, um, you know, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. We've got all kinds of cool things that we'll be showing. And uh, remember, the truth will set you free. And um, I really appreciate you guys for... Uh, watching the video. Thanks.